All right, welcome to our Bare Bones Study Salvation in Israel's program. This is session eight, and this is the last session. Now, look, we, last week we were looking at the parable of the sower, and uh, so there's a few things that I want to put on the board. If you notice, those of you that are on Zoom, there is a different timeline up here today. Don't panic about that. If you want to try to copy it down, you can, but when those notes get sent out to you, this timeline is in those notes. And so uh, those of you here that have those notes in front of you, there is a place as we progress through the session today where you're going to be looking at that timeline yourself. And so we were looking at the parable of the sower uh, where Jesus is speaking to the believing remnant. That's why the whole thing was in parables. So he could say things to them that the apostate element in the nation would not be able to understand. And he was talking to them about persecutions that were going to be taking place in the first half of Daniel's 70th week. And so we started out with that by talking about, let me just see if I can put it over here. There was seed by the wayside. And that seed by the wayside is where he was talking about where the gospel of the kingdom was being preached to, those, to unbelieving Israel. Not all of them were going to receive that message. So look, I'm going to call... And I'm going to use this abbreviation, A-I, that is apostate Israel, okay? And so that's who he was talking about when he got to this part of the parable. What are they doing? The believing remnant is going into the synagogues and they're presenting Jesus as the Christ. They're presenting the gospel of the kingdom. And where is that happening? When you look at this chart, look, this, this is the dispensation of Gentile grace. That's going to end at the blessed hope. Whenever we're going to rise to meet the Lord, and then so shall be with the Lord. That's the end of the dispensation of Gentile grace. That is going to start now the resumption of God's program with Israel, the prophetic program. There is a time at the beginning of that when He is granting repentance to Israel. And I'm talking about those who are in the land. Because when you're talking about the, those that are in the land, it's a very different issue than those that are outside the land. Let me just give you a, a little tidbit here about that. The policy of evil is structured in a very particular way as it is geared against the believing remnant in the land of Israel. But do you realize that outside the land of Israel, the policy of evil changes its tactics and form and it's going about its business in a very different way. So that during that time at the resumption of the program, you actually have two different policy of evils at work. I mean, it's, the, there, it's all the satanic policy of evil, but it has one way that it's working within the land, and it has another way that it's working outside of the land. Now, that's all we have time to say about that. But in, but, and so we're talking about right now those that are in the land. God is granting them a time of repentance where they can believe the gospel of the kingdom, be justified unto eternal life. And so they're doing that by going into the synagogue and, and present, using their scriptures and presenting all of that. When this time is over, this time of repentance is over, <clears throat> and the marker for that is when that seven-year covenant is confirmed between the Antichrist and the nation at large, that is the end of the time of repentance being offered to the nation. At that time, then the believing remnant are told to separate themselves from that vain religious system that is going on in the nation. And that means they're no longer going to go back in there. They're no longer going to be arguing with them about Jesus being the Christ. In fact, they're told, stop all of that. Because God is no longer offering repentance. And that's why we covered this in Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. He said, it is impossible to renew them again under repentance. They've had that opportunity. That time has come and gone. And, he's, and, and he even tells them. And for you to go back in there and continue to try to do that, now that God has withdrawn that offer, is to crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. So you don't want to do that. And so that's going to be, look, that's going to be a difficult thing, and I think it's hard sometimes for us Gentiles to really wrap our minds around 
how much all of that is kind of built in with, with, with the, the Jewish people. And for them to, to separate from all of that, I mean, even the believers in Jesus, that's going to be a, a test of them. But they are called to do that separation. So that's the seed by the wayside if they don't receive it. And by the way, does anybody remember once that period of time is up, for those that have, have, have said no to the gospel of the kingdom, that represents an event that we call the what? Thank you, Linda. The falling away. That's the falling away. That has nothing to do with the dispensation of Gentile grace. That has nothing to do with what the Apostle Paul was talking about over there in the pastoral epistles where he talked about, you know, in the last days there'll be, the, you know, he's, that's, that, he's talking about at the end of the dispensation of grace. This is the falling away. This is talking about unbelieving Israel and, and their decision to choose to follow the Antichrist and believe that he is their Messiah. Now you're going to get into Daniel's 70th week. Now I got, I got a lot of numbers up there and we're going to do those today and, and iron all that out for you. But let's just continue through the parable of the sower. Let me give you the next um, verse on that and that is going to be Matthew chapter 13 and verse 7. And he says, and some, some of that seed, some fell upon, uh, among thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Now by the way, this first one right here, I know I don't have much this is phase one of the policy of evil, and that is basically attack the message. So the message that the believing remnant is bringing to the unsaved in Israel, that is what is being attacked. But now when we get to this next seed, now this is going to be seed in, I'm just going to put among the thorns, okay? And so when he talks about, <clears throat> and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. This is now, now back here, and I just don't have time, room here, but this has happened back during the time of repentance to Israel. That's an R. Okay, this is going to happen in the first half of Daniel's 70th week. So now, that seed among thorns, that's going to be happening right along here. Okay, and what you have, and I guess I ought to do this in a different color so I can so you can kind of see it very readily, is that here's the believing remnant now that comes out of this. They get formed, and you're going to come up to a certain place here like this. And I'm just saying this, this is the measure of the believing remnant. But there's going to be a persecution that happens to them here. We read this last week in Hebrews. I don't mean to go back and reteach that, but he said, you have not yet resisted unto blood. What did that mean? It meant that the persecution that they're enduring is mental in nature. So I'm just going to put, put that up here. So that is a mental attack, okay, that is now going to come against the believing remnant. That is going to be, that's, there's going to be a lot of components to that. You may be ostracized from your family. Things will be said about you. And all those things are not necessarily true. Some of them are. And they're looking at that like that's a bad thing. But they're gonna, there's going to be other things that are said about them. We read those verses last week. And so there's going to there's be that. Then we're going to come. <clears throat> well, I sure hope. I, sure, I, 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 feel, I feel like I'm. Let me just get this next one here. So in the first half of the week, they've got those mental attacks. And some of them, when they see that, they're going to drop out. And what's going to happen then is the believing remnant is going to shrink. So let's do it just like this. So now you've got the believing remnant up here, and now the attacks are physical. And we read some verses last week that talked about that, that, the, that, uh, that those attacks would turn physical, and now they are resisting unto blood. Okay. Now, when we left off at the very end of the lesson last week, we, we, we looked at a verse that said there are two things that were going to plague the believing remnant to cause them not to be faithful. The first one was the care of this world. And we talked about that a little bit. And that's where we ended. The one we didn't talk about is the deceitfulness of riches. And that was the other one. I'm only going to read a couple of verses about this. I'll make a couple of comments and then we got to move on with it. But here we are. Let's take, take a look at these verses. Mark 10, 24. 
And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. The important phrase there is to trust in riches. In other words, they're expecting the riches to be able to help them get through this time. That that is the thing that's going to preserve them. And the Old Testament is full of contrary statements to that. That if you trust in your riches, you're going to fall. Let me give you the next verse. 1 Timothy 6, 17. You say, oh wait, we're in Paul's epistles. Okay, you didn't say that. I'm saying that's what you should be thinking. Okay. Oh, we're in Paul's epistles. Look what Paul says. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And when he's talking about all things, he's not talking about any of the physical material world. He's talking about this, the riches of Christ, the spiritual riches that are ours and that's where our focus ought to be. Here's the third uh, reference I want to give you. And that is, oh, you know what? Where's the psalm reference? There it is. I, I, I skipped this one. Let me go back. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. So you can see the riches are not, you know what? They're not going to be able to preserve you and they can't do anything else either. In fact, you're going to find out during that time, once the, the tribulation cranks up, uh, everybody that trusted in riches is going to be sorely disappointed at that time. Okay, so in the fifth installment, the seed that fell on stony ground. Now look, in your notes, can I just say it this way? Because I'm trying to show you that through the first half of the week, there's a progression. And so I'm talking to you about like the seed on stony ground is a, a time. It's not really a time. You know what it is. They all got that message back here. It's just that some of them, you know, when the, when the persecution first starts, they drop out. There's some of them that by the time that it escalates and gets physical, they drop out. So, but I'm talking to you about it like it's a time because that is the time they're coming to when the persecution is too much for them. Now someone's going to look at that and go, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's not really a time. He's talking about the different ones that receive the gospel. Yes, I understand that. But I'm trying to get you to see this on a linear timeline that not everybody's dropping out at the same time or for the same reason. That's what all that's about. Okay, so now let's take a look at these scriptures in Matthew 10, 17. But beware of men... For they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Now, when they're brought before councils, look, I wish I had time to talk about this in detail. But when they are being brought before councils, they're going to be offered an opportunity to stop all of this Jesus being the Messiah business and come on back into the vain religious system. They're offered that here, and they're offered that here. And, and if you don't, here's what's going to happen. Those councils are going to strip them of their wealth. And they're going to take their possessions. So there's something happening. Look, uh, I, I wanted to get to this in the notes. There's just too much here. When you get over in the Hebrew epistles, guess who, guess who they're going to be talking about that is sitting back in the Old Testament that's going to, that was in a very similar predicament to the way the believing remnant are going to be. Job. Let me ask you a question. Did Job lose anything? Lost it all. That is what is going to be happening to... And that's going to be why it's hard for a rich man not, not to believe that Jesus is the Christ, but to actually enter the kingdom because he's going to have to get rid of his riches. Think about the rich young ruler. And Jesus said, hey, go sell all you have, give the money to the poor, come follow me, you'll have treasure in heaven. It says he went away sorrowfully. Why? Because he had great riches. He wasn't willing to give that up. Now that's a particular thing, by the way, that is happening out there in the fifth installment. 
Okay? So don't try to make an application of that somewhere where it isn't. But that's, that's happening out there. So they will deliver you up to the councils. And they will scourge you in their synagogues. And they are now resisting unto blood. And, and, and it's this time that the Antichrist is now working on the, on the temple. And what you have is, and I've got a little box here that says it's during this time that the temple gets rebuilt. And when it does, what is, what is unbelieving Israel going to do? They're going to go back into that temple and they're going to restart the sacrifices and the oblations. And now the believing remnant says when that happens... See, you've already withdrawn yourself once. You're not going back into the center. When the temple gets rebuilt, now you're going to go without the gate, which is outside the city of Jerusalem. So while, the, while unbelieving Israel is all gathering over there at the temple for sacrifices, they're supposed to go outside of the city of Jerusalem, identifying them with the Lord who was crucified outside the city, and bear His reproach. You're doing something that obviously aligns you with Jesus because you believe he's the Christ. And here's what else you believe. It is only the blood of Christ that can cover your sins because as Hebrews 10 said, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So you're putting something else on display. You're really separating yourself once again. And so now everything is... And when they do that, that causes Satan to up the ante now and to start the next phase of this. So the believing remnant shrunk a little bit from the first one. And now we're going to come over here and do this one. So now you've got the believing remnant being shrunk again. Because when people have to make those kinds of decisions, hey, I'm going to be scourged in the synagogue. Hey, you're going to strip me of my wealth. I'm going to lose my stuff. A bridge too far for two minutes. So, so the believing remnant, the, I'm talking about the faithful in the believing remnant. You understand? I'm talking about the remnant within the remnant. Now, it's not just mental attack and it's not just scourging. Now, it's a kill order. And that, that is going to be the way it is going to be all the way to the midpoint of the tribulation. So these physical attacks are going to be escalated now. Okay, so let me... Let me take this over to um, Matthew chapter 10 and take a look at this in verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. How does that happen? Because here's, what, here's what's happening here. As the believing remnant is becoming more and more hated and they're being dealt with more and more severely, what Satan is really after is, let me hunt down every one of these members of the believing remnant and kill them off so that we don't have to deal with them anymore. So that, that's, that's what's going on here. Now that's important to something else we're going to be discussing today. Now, my understanding, and I am, um, let, me, let me just give you a caveat to this, okay? I, I wish I knew everything, and I knew it certainly, and I had, you know, absolute 100% confidence. Uh, none of those things are true. I don't know all of it, and the th there are some things I don't have 100% confidence in. But I'm fairly confident, and here's the thing about this. I, I, I do know what's being, what's being said here, that they are going to, Put them to death. And so you know what? A brother is going to betray his brother. And he's going to tell the government of the Antichrist where his brother is. And they're going to capture that guy and they're going to put him to death. The guy that betrayed his brother is going to think he is doing God's service. Totally convinced he's the godly person in this. There's a whole lot that goes on around him. If we had time to discuss, if we just had three more Sundays, I could show you things that would make you, I know, I, and, okay, but I could show you things that would make you realize the circumstances that these people are operating in is a level of deception that the world will have never seen or experienced before. 
the false prophets that are going to be there are going to have such power to perform such wonders that the Bible says that they could deceive even the very elect. And if you're an unsaved guy, what chance do you have of seeing through that? You don't. So there's a lot of things that are, the dynamic has a lot of aspects to it. I'm just trying to get that. So now let's look at this next one, Mark 13, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, 9. Yeah. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise. That's what I was just talking to you about. And shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now let me tell you what the end is. If this, and this is, the, this is the first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. This is the second half of that. This is the time of the end. It's three and a half years long. Now, when he says at the end of this passage, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He is saying this, if you can make it to right here, when the end starts, if you can, if he that is, Faithful unto, up until the time of the end. That guy is going to have a special salvation. We're not talking about salvation from the debt and penalty of sin or the salvation of being justified unto eternal life. How do you know that? Because why? Yeah, they're already saved. That's what makes them part of the believing remnant, believing remnant right? So he's not talking about that. He's talking about a different salvation. And we're going to see that in just a moment. So you've got these steps. So the believing remnant is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And now they're out there and they're being hunted down. Okay. Now, so now let's take a look at this in Mark. And oh, oh I, need, I need to finish this one. I'm sorry. So let's catch this last, last verse here. And he that shall endure unto the end... The same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So guess what? The, the, the time of repentance to Israel was happening here before the first half of the week, but outside the land of Israel, guess what? Now the gospel of the kingdom is being preached outside the land of Israel to all nations. Why is it going like that? He told you back in Acts chapter 1 what the progression was. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. So you know what? The nation of Israel is going to get that first. Then the uttermost parts of the earth are going to get that. So just don't, don't be... That's why I said things are different in the land than from out of the land. Okay. So when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place... Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And what, so I have the abomination of desolation. You have to kind of follow this little line up to this blue X right here. That's the midpoint of the week. And you have these things that are happening. You have the abomination of desolation, which is the image of the Antichrist that gets set up in the temple. The Antichrist goes in and sits down in the holy place and proclaims himself to be God. He erects an image of himself that everybody needs to come and worship the image of the beast. And so the, and so the apostate Israel, the unsaved in Israel, at this point, there is now an execution order for them. See, this is a double-edged sword. They thought this was their Messiah back here, and now they're turning in their family members and friends. And they're going to be executed, not knowing that as soon as you get over here, now we're going to turn the tables on you guys, 
and Satan is going to wipe out unbelieving Israel as well. The other thing that's going to go on here is, um, I'm sorry, he's going to break the covenant at the mid-mark. This is where you're going to take the mark or the number of his name, and we're going to get to that, and he will divide the land for gain. It's no longer going to be for the nation of Israel anymore. That's all going to get divided up. The whole lot of things that are happening there at the midpoint. Okay, now the Mark passage, Mark 13, 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate. For whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not uh, ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. So now that's how this is going to close out in the first half of the week. And I don't have this in your notes. It, there was just too much, but i got to make you see this. Got your Bible? Turn to Psalm 83. Psalm 83. And let's just read the first couple of verses of this psalm together because this is really... <coughs> this is going to show you what is going to happen at the midway point because up till there... By the way, I can extend this kill order... For the believing remnant. It doesn't just stop there. It's going to go all the way to the midpoint. Okay. But at the midpoint now. I'm going to show you in Psalm 83. The extermination order. Now for even the unsaved. In Israel. So take a look at Psalm 83 in verse 1. Keep not thou silence O God. Hold not thy peace. And be not still O God. For lo thine enemies make a tumult. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. I want you to notice there's two groups here. They have taken <coughs> crafty counsel against thy people. Who is that? That's, the, na that's the, the nation as a whole, which would include the unsaved, and consulted against thy hidden ones. Who is that? Remember. Yeah, that, that, okay. The, the hidden ones are the members of the believing remnant that God is now supernaturally protecting and hiding. And so you have the hidden ones and then you have the, the, the people in general. But let's keep reading. Verse 4. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel be, may be no more in remembrance. Now we could come on down and you could read all ten of those that are going to confederate against the nation at the midpoint of the week. But we've got what we're after. What are they after? Let's cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance in the earth. Now you've got a full-on extermination policy for everybody. But who is going to be counted worthy to escape those things which are going to come upon them? Only the faithful among the believing remnant. If, you are part of un, if you're part of apostate Israel, God's not protecting you. He's not hiding you. He's not giving you provision. And you're going to be fair game for the Antichrist. What if you're part of the believing remnant that you've dropped out already? You're going to be treated just on the earth. You're going to be treated just like unsaved Israel, right? Now, these guys are going to be resurrected, but there's not going to be a reward. They're going to get eternal life. They're going to be resurrected, but they're going to live outside the kingdom. We did that outer darkness deal on Tuesday. If you saw that, you already know what I'm talking about. Okay. So, that, so what's happening here is first in the first half, there's a push to get rid of the believing remnant. And then at the second half, there is a push to get rid of them all. Let me take you over to, and, here, and here's my understanding of this. And 
when I made that little speech a while ago, I said, I wish I knew everything and I wish I had 100% confidence. I, I don't know everything. But, but here, here's what I, I know what everybody says because I did, I did the research on this. I know that everybody thinks that over here, if the believing remnant recants and takes the mark or worships the beast or throws in the towel and goes back into the vain religious system, they'll be forgiven. I don't find that written anywhere I could look in my Bible. And that is so commonly said that I thought, i got to go find this. I don't find it in the... Pro now, I'm not saying it's not there, but I didn't find it. I didn't find and by the way, every resource I have that teaches that, I scoured all of them, like, give me the verse. Nobody's got a verse. You're assuming... That if they take the mark, they can come on back in. I don't find that. Here's what I find. That during the first half of the week, you know, it's a mental battle. Now it's a physical punishment. Now we're going to kill them. Satan's not interested in them coming on back. He's just interested in getting rid of them. Did you read Psalm 83 with me? Did that sound like, you know what, if you want to come on back in, we'll forgive it. and we'll, You can just join the vain religion. No. Let's wipe them out so that the name of Israel is no longer on the earth. And that's the way all of this gets talked about. I don't see anything that says, look, if you take the mark, we'll let you back in and all. I don't think you get a chance. And we're going to talk about that. Once the kill order goes out for the believing remnant, if they catch you, they're not asking you to recant. They're cutting your head off. Once the midpoint takes place and, they, and, you, and you're a part of unbelieving Israel, they're not asking you to join up either. Guess what? They already thought that was their Messiah. They were already on board. But in the second half of the week, now they're being exterminated. Everybody following what I'm saying? I could tell you the other thing and be in the company of everybody else that teaches about this I just can't find it. And until I can find it, I can't, I, you know what, I, I'm not going to tell it to you. And, 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 and I'm not saying, you know, I, I know it all flawlessly, but I, here's what I know. What I put up here, I've identified for you in the scripture. So that's, I, I don't know what else to do with that. Okay, so now let's take a look at this next thing in the book of Revelation. Oh, um, that, here's that Matthew 10, 22, and I don't know why I have that in there, but that's out of place. So, <laughs> and I did that too. Why did I do that? I skipped this thing in Revelation 6. That's why. Let me back up. Let me read it to you. You have your notes in front of you. Those of you that don't have your notes yet, take a look with me in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. And when, he had, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for two things. For the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now that's happening in the first, you know, that, that's happening right back over here. Are they going to be continue to be hunted through the second half? They are. So just because I ended the little kill area there, that doesn't mean if they don't find them that they won't kill them. Uh, they are certainly going to try to do that. But by the time the midpoint of the week arrives, the believing remnant has already been under a kill order, and they're, they're, they're just trying to stay alive. Matthew 10, now here it is, Matthew 10, 22, And you'll be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endure to the end, I talked to you about that a moment ago, shall be saved. In other words, he's going to find a deliverance. And if they hold fast their profession... And do the things from the corrective doctrine they're supposed to do. They get a promise. And let me show you this promise. This is great. Luke 21, 16. 
And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. The promise is if you guys can hold out to the unto the end. Right there. Because this is the time of the end. If you guys can hold out faithful to there, I will supernaturally protect you and not a hair of your head will perish. You'll be saved. He's not talking about saved from sin. He's talking about what? Saved from the wrath that God is going to pour out on the earth. Saved from the Antichrist. Saved from all of those things that are, you know, trying to hunt them down. Okay. In your patience possess ye your souls. Has to do with, and this ought to strike a familiar chord with all of us. Their patient endurance of all of the things that are leading up to the time of the end. What do we say about suffering? Patient endurance. That's exactly what he's asking them to do. To patiently endure. Now, are they enduring so that they can be joint heirs? What are they, what are they enduring so they can do what? Because they want to be part of the Lord's generation, part of His royal house, and reign with Him in the kingdom. That's what they're looking for. We patiently endure because we're looking to make an impact in Satan's realm to angels and to men, and we're looking to be joint heirs. So there's a similar thing going on, but the ends are a little bit different. Our vocation, of course, is in the heavenly places. They have to hold fast to that midpoint of the week, unto the end. Now let's come back to Jesus' parable and pick up the end of that. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Let's go to verse 23 and get Jesus' interpretation of this. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. You know what he's talking about here? Some of the folks back here that heard that word, they weren't going to drop out at the mental persecution. They didn't drop out when it got physical. They didn't drop out when they got a death order put on them. You know what they did? They held up faithful to the end. They're going to get protected through that last half. And one day they're going to stand before, I'm quoting here, stand before the Son of Man and they're going to receive a reward and some will get a hundredfold and some sixtyfold and some thirtyfold. That's what that's talking about. Now, <clears throat> I don't have time to go into all the details of that in this session because we still have a lot to go. But the last three and a half years, this is a, that's the countdown to the Lord coming back and destroying his enemies and setting up his kingdom. If they can hold faithful to the midpoint of the week, to the time of the end, then they'll be hit, supernaturally hidden and provided for and protected. Guess what that's called in Hebrews? That's the so great salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's what he's talking about. Okay. Now we want to do two things. We want to finish off our timeline, and I want to talk about the believing remnant taking the mark of the beast. If you had said this to me before I studied this out, I would have said, if you said, what about a member of the believing remnant, they get over here, and they get caught, and they say, hey, look, I'll take the mark. I don't think that can happen. I'll show you why in just a moment. But if they did, and you had asked me this before I did this study and really looked at things, I would have said, because of the nature of what it means to be justified unto eternal life, if you took the mark and worshipped the beast, I would have said, you would have lost reward, but you would not have lost your salvation. Why? Why? Because every other thing I see in my Bible says that. By the way, is taking the mark and worshiping the beast any worse than back in the Old Testament worshiping Molech 
and making your children pass through the fire. So that one's not too bad. But if you worship this one over here, now you're going to go to hell. See, I don't think the verse, in fact, I'm going to show you this. I don't think the verse is saying if you worship the image of the beast or take his mark or number, you're going to go to hell. I don't think it's saying that. I think it's saying everybody that takes his mark or number is already unsaved. And I'm going to show you why I think that's true. So pay attention to this. I'm going to look at some things in Revelation here. And I want you to look at the wording. So I understand what everybody's looking at. So let's look at it in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice. If any man worship the beast and his image. And receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. By the way, that phrase, drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, is talking about all of the wrath that God is pouring out during this time in the second half of the week. That's what that phrase is referring to. That's not describing hell or the lake of fire. That is the wrath of God that is being poured out on the earth. But look at the rest of this now. And it said, verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You know what he's saying there? The punishment and the wrath that they're going to endure in this second half here, that, that's going to resonate forever, what everybody had to endure about that because of how bad it was going to be. That verse really isn't talking about anything in eternity at all. Okay, now you say, but, but let's suppose you think it is. Take a look at it. If any man worship the beast or his image and receive his mark. And you say, okay, well, I think that includes the believing remnant. And if that happens to them, and I happen to think that is describing eternal punishment, so I'm just saying that's what will happen to the believing remnant. That's a very dangerous thing. Because if you're taking people who have been justified unto eternal life. And who are in Christ. And by something they do. All of that is being reversed. You just did away with your own security. So be careful about that. But here's the next thing. Take a look at this. This is going to be the next verse. This is Revelation 13, 16. Look at this. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. So here's my, here's my point here. How many does he cause to receive the mark? Look at the verse. See, if you're going to say, if any man, and you're going to include the believing remnant, takes the mark and worships the beast, and you're going to take the rest of that verse to mean eternal punishment, which I don't take it to mean that at all. But if you're going to take it to mean that, then if, you say, if any man, and that would include the believing remnant. Well, here, and he causeth all. And then look at the detail. Small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, do you get the idea, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to take the mark. But is that a true statement? Does everybody take the mark? Do all take the mark? So he's not talking, even though he used the word all, he's not talking about all without exception. He's gonna, he is making a statement here about all that do get deceived by him and they're taking the mark because they're not going to be able to buy or sell without it and all that kind of business. So if it's, if, if, and by the way, you say, well, Brother Mike, how do you know everybody doesn't take the mark? Let's back up one verse to verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. What happens if you don't take, the, take the, the mark or worship the image? 
Well, wait, I thought he said he, got, he deceived all of them into taking it. Do you see? The Bible's going to tell you not everybody does it. You, you, so when you're starting going, if any man takes the mark or worships the beast. See, once again, are you talking without any exception whatsoever? And you're forgetting one important thing. Nobody goes to hell because they worship the beast. I think we're reading that wrong. Why does anybody back here, why does any, anybody back here go to hell? Because they rejected the gospel of the kingdom. It's not what they did, it's what they didn't do. They had a chance to have their sins forgiven and believe the gospel of the kingdom and they rejected it. Folks, if you rejected the gospel of the kingdom, you ain't going even if you don't take the mark or worship the beast. You with me? So we're misreading that. We're reading that like God is telling you why these people are going to hell. That's not what he's doing. He's describing to you the kind of people that will take the mark. Now, all the things that I've said to you up to this point come into play right here. If there's a kill order out here on you and they kill you and they're not looking for you to recant because I can't find it. But if you get a kill order out here and, you're, and, and, and that you get caught, they're not offering you the mark. If you're a member of the believing remnant and you get discovered, you're going to have your head cut off. We read about some of those. How long, O oh Lord, will you not avenge our blood? On Okay. Guess what? You get your head cut off and you get killed. They're not offering you the mark because they're trying to wipe out the believing remnant. You know what that means? It's impossible for the believing remnant to take the mark because the mark doesn't happen until after the midpoint. Before the midpoint, they're already under a kill order. Catch them, shoot to kill. Do you see what I'm saying? And because the mark, all of that business doesn't take place until the second half, I can't find anywhere where... And unbelieving Israel finally discovers, oh, this guy's not our Messiah. I can't find anywhere where unbelieving Israel takes the mark either. And, uh, and so I'm inclined to think, I'm not 100%, I don't want to be dogmatic about it. I'm just being honest with you. I know as a preacher, you're supposed to say everything you think like it's, you know, in stone. I'm just being honest with you about this. I don't find anything in my Bible that tells me any Israelite takes the mark. You know what it appears to me? This may be something for Gentiles. Because I, un, if un, look out here, here is the believing remnant. After this, let's cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel be no more remembered in the earth. That's everybody. You're, you're, you're interested in cutting them off, but you're going to give them a chance to go ahead and come on into the, to the vain religious system. Well, which is it? You can't have it both ways. We can't exterminate this people and then leave them alive and bring them on in. So I don't find that. I don't find the verses that say that, although I realize everybody teaches it that way. But I'm just saying, I don't know that any Israelite is going to take that mark. But here's what I believe with all my heart. The believing remnant, they're under a kill order before it ever comes on the scene. It doesn't matter. If, you're a believer, if you get betrayed by your brother and they come and find you, they cut your head off, they're not offering you the mark. They're getting rid of you. So I think the answer to this is the believing remnant cannot take the mark. They're not being offered the mark. And taking the mark or worshiping the beast would do them no good. They're going to be executed. To me, that makes all those verses fit together. Now, Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but here's the deal. So in my eyes, you got a kill order coming in here, and here's what you have for the rest of this, for this part. Of, this part of the believing remnant, they're hidden. They're protected. They're provided. All the things they need so that not a hair of their hair will perish. And that's a pretty good promise, isn't it, Linda?
If you've come all the way to here, it's because you do know something. Everybody that doesn't have any root, like he talked about in the parable, you're right. They have already... You know what the amazing thing is here? If you get through this one, nobody drops out after that one. So just because it goes up to kill, the people that have made the decision to endure all of this, they're in. They're, they're going, we're in. But I am going to tell you, it is only at the end of that. I don't know what the percentage is. I don't know how to tell you that. I, I, I mean, I'm looking at if you're... I, I don't know if it's all evenly divided or what, but this, this is only a, a piece of the whole remnant. Okay, so now i got two other things i got to do here. So let's take a look at this. I want to talk about all the numbers that I've got up here, so let me walk you through them real quickly. So as you can tell, from right here to right here, that's 1,260 days or 42 months or three and a half years. From here to the end of the week is another 1,260 days or three and a half years. But according to Daniel, there's a middle month of 30 days. It is the last month of the first half of the tribulation. And he's going to give you a number that says, because here's what's going to happen. At 1,230 days, the sacrifices get taken away in that rebuilt temple. Remember, they've gone back in. They're doing the sacrificial system again. They're all excited. It's their Messiah. The temple's been rebuilt. And then the Antichrist is going to come in 30 days before the end of that first three and a half years at the 1,230 day mark. And he's going to stop. He's going to take away the sacrifices. What happens in that 30 days? He begins to set up the image of the beast. Now look, I do know a couple of guys that go... They're being given 30 days back here because, okay, <laughs> see, there's too much in my head. Could I, if I could just open my head up and, you know, it'd be a mess. But if, if I could open up my head and tell you what was in there, you realize that when you get into the fifth course of punishment, the things that are happening in the first installment, when they went away captive to Babylon, there are a lot of similarities that happen in the fifth installment that are very parallel to the first installment. Who took them away captive in the first installment? That's right, Nebuchadnezzar and, and, the, and the kingdom of Babylon. Do you remember what Nebuchadnezzar does? He sets up an image of gold and commands that everybody bow down and worship the image or be cast into the furnace that they used to melt the gold which is a little over 1,000 degrees, just under 1,100. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That's the Babylonian names for those guys. He finds out that they're not... He brings them in. He says, "But I know who you guys are, but you know what? I'm pretty mad about this, and if you don't bow down, I'm throwing you in the furnace this very hour. And they said, we are not careful to answer thee, O king, in this matter. <laughs> Because we ain't doing it. And, if our, and our God who is able to deliver us, if he does, great. And if he doesn't, we still won't bow down. He gets the biggest, strongest guys. He says, the mighty men in his army, they put on all this protective clothing. They grab these guys. They're going to throw them into the furnace. It burns up all of his guys. Throwing them in. And he's looking, and he goes, he looks around, and he says, wait, didn't we throw three men in the fire? And they go, yes, we did. He goes, then how come I see four, and the, this is amazing, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God? I'm thinking, what are you looking at that made you think that was the Son of God? And so he goes over as close as he can get, and he hollers in, he goes, are you guys Okay. I'm doing my paraphrase, right? <laughs> he calls them by name and asks them, and they go, yeah, we're good. We're good. He said, can you come out here? You know what? I would have loved for Shadrach to go, why don't you come in here? Let's talk in here. It's a little chilly out there. But he doesn't because he's, you know, he's godly and he's not doing that. <laughs> I still would have loved it. They come out, and the Bible says their clothes weren't singed, 
and not even the smell of the smoke was on him. And you know what he does then? He says, okay, I'm making a new rule. Anybody that doesn't worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're going to destroy him, we're going to destroy his family, we're going to tear his house, and we're going to burn it all up, we're going to turn it into a dunghill. That's what he said. So worship that God. Because anybody that can do that, that's the guy. Well, they made, a, they made an image and everybody's going to bow down and worship or be put to death. Guess what's happening in the fifth installment? There's going to be an image. And so, and there's a couple of guys, I, I love it, but you know, they're saying that, you know, the, 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 this 30 days that happened on here, they said, that's because Nebuchadnezzar gave everybody 30 days to make the decision about it. But I looked at that, I looked at that everywhere. I can't see that. So maybe he did, maybe he did. I just can't tell you that because I can't find that. But it wouldn't surprise me. I'll just say that. That wouldn't shock me. But I can't find it written. So it's really hard for me to just act like it. You know why? Because the folks that listen to us and you folks on Zoom, I'm talking, I'm, there. I'm talk, I, your, your display is over here, but you're right there. You folks on Zoom are way too sharp. As soon as I say, just like Nebuchadnezzar gave them 30 days, they're go, that, they say this, that Israel, unsaved Israel gets 30 days to decide to worship the I can't find that. But you guys, if I say it, you're going you're gonna to email me and go, where is that reference? <laughs> I know you are. So I'm telling you, I don't see one. So I ain't saying it. But look, here's what you have. You do have 30 days, though, when all of these things I listed for you began to go into play so that at the midpoint, guess what? There is an image. And the mark and the number are set up. And people are going to have to take it. But remember, now unsaved Israel is being hunted down too. Psalm 83. I think this is for Gentiles. And it, maybe I'm wrong. But I don't see anybody over there in Israel taking this. Because once they see who he is, and he's saying, hey, guess what? I appreciate y'all uh, uh, betraying all your family members. Those people that believed in Jesus appreciate you doing that. And as a reward, now we're going to kill you. He's not, interested, he's not interested in bringing them in. He's just interested in exterminating. If he can exterminate Israel off the earth, guess what? He can retain possession of the earth. This is not for nothing. He already knows at that time he's lost the heavenly places. In fact, at the midpoint, he'd been booted out. We're already up there. Only thing he's got left is try to hang on to the earth. So it makes sense. If God promised to do this through this nation, and we, 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 we tried to exterminate the believing remnant, now we're going to get the rest of them because we don't want to take a chance on that. I just see Gentiles taking all of this. Anyway, there's more to it than that, and I wish we had time to talk about it. So let me do this. So Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. You see that right here? From the time that the sacrifice is taken away. That is the 30 days before the end of the first 1260 days. <clears throat> from the time the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So what do you have is you have 1260 and 30 is nine, that's 1290. That's where I think the 1290 comes from. Now take a look with me at, and, and, and look, we're covering a lot of ground here in a little bit of time. But what you have is 1260, midpoint, 1260. Then when you get to the end of the 1260, you have 30 days of darkness. Remember all those passages we've read so many times before. And the sun shall turn to darkness and the moon into blood and the stars shall withdraw their shining. You know, and all of that kind of stuff. You have 30 days of darkness. And then what happens at the end of those 30 days of darkness? The Lord Jesus comes with the brightness of His coming. And He starts the Armageddon campaign which is going to last for 10 days. Those are those days of awe on the Jewish calendar. 
So you got 30 days and you got 10 days. And then you got five more days because you got another scripture over there. Let me just read it for you. Let me see if I can get to it. it okay. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't put it in the, in the PowerPoint. Let me see if I put it in the notes. Man, I guess I didn't. So you're in Daniel 12. So just, just flip over there. So Daniel chapter 12 and look at... Um, Verse 12. Okay, verse 11, there's the 1290 days. Verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. 1,335 days. And you know what that is? If you count these last 30 days, to the end of that is 1290. 1290 and the 30 for the darkness, the 10 for the Armageddon campaign... I haven't told you what happens here yet, but you got five days left before the next feast day. Those 45 days added to the 1290 gives you 1335. So all of those days work out. Sorry. We, we need a whole lesson on this, I know. But here's the thing. What is happening in these last five days? Armageddon is over. He's won the battle. So what does he do? He sends his angels to the four winds of heaven... To gather his elect and bring them back. And when you say, from the four winds of heaven, wait, they're in heaven? <laughs> you understand, the winds of heaven, he's talking about wherever the wind blows on this earth, that's where they're scattered to. He's going to send his angels everywhere out there, he's going to bring them back. Secondly, he has the judgment of the nations. How they treated the members of the believing remnant that were scattered out among them is how they're going to be judged as a nation as you get ready to go into the kingdom. Number three, he's going to resurrect the dead to go into that kingdom. David is going to get resurrected. He'll be the king over Israel. The 12 apostles will be resurrected. They'll sit on 12 thrones judging the tribes. But then Jesus will be king of kings. He'll be over all of that. And then you have a judgment of rewards for the kingdom, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. You'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's going to be with the believing remnant. The new Jerusalem will ascend. Who was it? Uh, so I was talking to somebody this week, letting them have a, a study on Wednesdays, I think it is. Somebody was asking me about a passage, and I said, let me see if I can address it on Sunday. This is it. The new Jerusalem is going to come down right here during this five days. Because he was talking about that new Jerusalem and whosoever entereth there, blah, blah, blah. He said, but without that city are whoremongers and liars and all that. And they're going like, if that's eternity, how in the world are we having that out there? Well, it's not eternity. It's before the millennial kingdom. And we know not everybody's perfect in the millennial kingdom because why? Because at the end of that kingdom, remember Satan's loosed out of the bottomless pit. He deceives the nations. They encompass Jerusalem about. Fire comes down from God out of heaven, devours them. And now it's all purged. But that new Jerusalem is going to come down right here before the start of the kingdom. And it's got to because Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, I'm, you know, if I go away, I'll come again. That where I am, there you may be also. You know what the new Jerusalem is? It's the residence of the Lord and everyone that is part of of that immediate ruling council in his government. Will the 12 apostles be there? Yes, they will. They'll all have a place there. Again, I know we need more time to talk about that. I'm over, and I, and I, and I, I, I guess I'm going to have to let you read about it. This is too interesting. The believing remnant out here in the fifth installment are able to have something to enable them to get through this that no one in the prophetic program from Abraham onward has ever had. I don't have time to talk about it in this. Because they are a kind, the scriptures in your notes, they are a kind of, the believing are a kind of first fruits of his creatures. What is he saying? He's saying there's something about the kingdom out here, how God is going to deal with them. What's one more thing that's going to be done here? God is going to give them the new covenant. What is the new covenant covenant for? A perfect justification and a perfect sanctification. 
They're going to get that while they're still on the earth right here. Nobody's ever had that in Israel's program before. Why? Why do they need that? Because if God doesn't give them a perfect justification and a perfect sanctification, they cannot be in the kingdom what he called them to be, a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. If they had had a perfect justification and a perfect sanctification when they got out of Egypt and got into the promised land, they would have set up the kingdom immediately and all of that would have happened back then. But they weren't spiritually fit to be that holy nation and kingdom of priests because they put themselves under the law and tried to produce all of that in their own power. And God gave them the law to show them you can't do it. You're going to need me to do it for you and give it to you as a free gift of grace. You'll never deserve it or earn it. And so the new covenant, so guess what? Here we are back here in the dispensation of Gentile grace. And, but we're not under a covenant, but here's what God said. I can give the benefits of that covenant to anybody I want to. He didn't say us because nobody knew about us back then. But go back over to Jeremiah 31 and look, the two components of the new covenant is a perfect justification and a perfect sanctification. And he said, that's what it's going to be at the new covenant. But they can't get the new covenant until after they're resurrected. So you got all those things that I'm talking to you about. You're going to gather his elect. He's going to have the judgment of the nations. He's going to resurrect everybody. He's going to have a judgment for reward. He'll give them all the new covenant. And once they've got that, then they'll move into the kingdom. New Jerusalem's already come down. All of that's happening. Guess what? Back here, you were given a perfect justification, a perfect sanctification, simply when you trusted Christ as your all-sufficient Savior, and that is what makes you spiritually fit to be His sons and daughters who will labor with Him in the heavenly places. That's it. So this whole idea of spiritual fitness is all wrapped up. Can I just say this just as an aside? There's two big issues about the Lord's table. One of those is about the mystery which Satan got caught in his own craftiness and he knew nothing about. But the other one is this. The Lord's table has to do with celebrating a perfect justification and a perfect sanctification that is given to a people by grace alone that makes them spiritually fit for his plan and purpose with them. And that's what the Lord's table, when it gets celebrated here, is doing, is calling attention to the fact that we've been given that spiritual fitness in Christ. And guess what? It doesn't matter what you do. He has made you to be the righteousness of God in Christ. There's your justification. And the holiness of God in Christ. There's your sanctification. And that's, that's what that is about. We, we need time to talk about that too. Okay. It's a lot. So thank you for letting me raise more questions than we could answer. And for hanging you out to dry on this. But look, what I hope we have been able to accomplish is for you to have seen enough of these verses and go through all, see enough detail that you understand no one in Israel was justified unto eternal life by works. And no one is losing their salvation. This, those, those are all misinterpretations of scriptures that are talking about rewards. I really hope that we've got that down. We'll, we'll have opportunity to talk about stuff more in the future, and I look forward to that. But anyway, because we were in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and we were talking about that, we did this study. I'm just going to wrap it up here, and we'll come back into Ephesians next time. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for these folks. Thank you for their kind attention. Thank you that they love your word, that they want to know about it, that they understand there's a vocation in the heavenly places for us, and that during that time of the end that's on this earth, that's going to be the day of Christ for us when we're actually sitting up there in those heavenly places and, and, and with an arm of the fellowship of the mystery, we're actually going to get to be involved in seeing uh, the completion and the accomplishment and the fulfillment of the prophetic program with the nation. Thank you, Lord, that we're going to be able to judge the earth and that we'll judge angels. And that, that has a, a, that's a real part that you want us to be knowledgeable about so that we can perform that function to your glory. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.